Good morning and welcome to our service of morning worship. And we are following on from our sermon series of looking at our favourite passages. And this morning we'll be hearing from Alan and he'll be preaching from the book of James. So welcome in the name of Christ, God's grace, mercy and peace be with you and also with you. So let's start our service this morning with our first song.
So we come to that part in our service this morning where we need to confess our sins and think about our past week and maybe things that we've done that we shouldn't have done or things that we've left undone that, you know, we should have done. So let's, in quietness, remember our faults and failings. Christ came in humility to share our lives. Forgive our pride. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ came with good news for all people. Forgive our silence. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ came in love to a world of suffering. Forgive our self-centeredness. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So may the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sin, heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And we'll now have our readings from James. Today's reading is taken from James chapter 5 verses 1 to 9. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in these last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourself in the day of the slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd just like to start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be on us now uh, to give me the word you want me to say and still our minds and open our ears so that we may truly hear your message. Amen. So, good morning. Uh, I must admit I'm rather surprised, um, but also very honoured uh, to be here today. Um, so, uh, thank you to Adam for the uh, invitation. Uh, and I'd just like to apologise for my voice, blame Everton. Uh, so, to the letter of James. Uh, when I was preparing for this morning, I thought, you know, I'll do plenty of research and get plenty of factual information in so that, you know, if I've misinterpreted everything and you disagree with everything that I say, well, no one can dispute facts. And then I discovered that almost everything about the book of James is like keenly contested. So that backfired on me. Um, however, the consensus is that the book was written by James, who was probably the oldest brother of Jesus. And we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that he became a Christian after the risen Lord appeared to him. So based on this, um, we know that it must have been written before AD 62 when James was martyred. While some characteristics and the contents of the letter suggest it may have, may have been written about AD 50, uh, which would make it one of the earliest writings of the New Testament with the possible exception of Galatians. It's an exceptionally practical letter, which is concerned about different parts of living a Christian life. 
So I chose the passage from James as a favourite passage uh, because as someone who is uh, passionate about social justice, it reaffirms to me that God is just and loving and wants us all to live in a fair society in which we all play a full part. Let's not forget that Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. God does not want oppression for his children and he will judge oppressors harshly. Sorry. Now, oppression can come in various forms including military, political, social and financial oppression. And one form usually leads to another. But what they all have in common is that they result in people being marginalised, having fewer rights and leading a life lacking in full participation in the activities of the community. And I think the different forms of oppression and their varying effects tie in neatly with the fact that the Hebrew words that describe the poor include those who are hungry, begging, physically and spiritually low, wrongfully impoverished, oppressed, homeless or humiliated. Now, oppression was basically an accepted fact of life in first century Palestine. The country was, of course, mil militarily occupied by the Romans whose empire was particularly concerned with maintaining order and collecting taxes. Poverty was also a significant aspect of first century life and food shortages were a common problem for all urban populations. And sadly, the rule of Jubilee laid down in the book of Leviticus, whereby debts would be canceled, slaves and prisoners freed and land returned to its original owners hadn't been enacted for four centuries. But being poor also brought with it a judicial weakness, whereby land or possessions could be taken by richer citizens who expected and received preferential treatment. So how welcome and thrilling must it have been to hear Jesus announce his manifesto in his first public reading? He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed. And perhaps how scary and alien to the Romans and the Sadducees. Now, when we consider Jesus and his ministry, and in particular his miracles, we should remember that like they were not just physical healings, which were miraculous enough, but they were gifts of shalom. Now, I used to think shalom meant peace, but Artie discovered shalom means wholeness. And, and, and his miracles transformed people who had been ostracized back into full members of the community of God. For example, when Jesus healed the leper in Luke chapter 5, He's immediately told to go to the temple, show himself to the priest and offer a sacrifice. This demonstrates not only his gratitude, but that he is now a member of God's community again, able to take part in communal praise after previously being a pariah. Similarly, the man Jesus healed from the illness that was deemed to have been caused by his own sins is freed not only from disease, but also from judgment, scorn and mistrust from his peers. Thankfully, the early church followed in Jesus' footsteps. We are told in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4 that the believers shared everything they had and that there were no needy people among them. When funds were low or people were in need, disciples would sell land that they owned and give the proceeds to the apostles to distribute to whoever needed it. So what does this all mean for us, for our lives and our faith today? In a country where 15 million people, including over 4 million children, are living in poverty, 
yet there are also 171 billionaires. I believe that there are three things that we can take from it. The first is that God is with those of us who are struggling. He shares our pain and our anxieties. This current system of such inequality is not what God wants for us, and he is alongside us fighting our corner. The second thing is that I think it's time for Christians to change the world again, 2,000 years on. Now there are two approaches we can adopt to doing this. Number one is from the bottom up, where we change things around where we are. I think this is something St George's is brilliant at. From Jackie Wynn Stanley, making sure anyone who came to Food Bank at least went home with something for that day. To Naomi and her amazing work with Feed in Liverpool. To the heartwarming and miraculous events going on at the pantry every single week. These amazing things done by awesome people, sorry, change lives and are probably the reason I stand here today. Um, now I, I became a Christian around the age of 20, but after, after like quite a few years, I kind of gave up on organised religion. I, I never stopped believing in God or, or Jesus, but I, I, I lost faith in organised religion. And it was only when I started coming back to St. George, well, coming to St. George's with Terry, and I saw, I saw all these amazing things going on, that I, <laughs> that's why I'm back here this morning. Now, the second approach is to change things from the top down. Archbishop Desmond Tutu once said, there comes a time when we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. So we, we must engage with the current system. We must vote for the candidate or party whose manifesto most closely aligns with God's vision for his word. Then we need to keep engaging with our MPs, email them and turn up when they hold meetings and surgeries. Tell them, you know, that, like we're, we're not standing for this anymore. You know, we want, we want society more to be ordered, like to God's vision. And then if nothing changes, then we turn up to protests and, we, and marches. The Reverend Martin Luther King Who's, who's a big hero of mine, it once declared that if any earthly institution or custom conflicts with God's will, it is your Christian duty to oppose it. You must never allow the transitory, evanescent demands of man-made institutions to take precedence over the eternal demands of the Almighty God. So the third and the final thing we can take from it is that we must continue to spread the good news of Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says the kingdom of God won't come in its fullness until the gospel is preached to all nations. Millions are short of food and money, but they're also in dire need of hope and something they can have faith in. Leonardo Boff, who's a, a liberation theologist whose book I'm reading at the moment, he says, the gospel is not aimed chiefly at modern men and women with their critical spirit, but first and foremost at non-persons, those whose basic dignity and rights are denied them. This leads to reflection in a spirit of prophecy and solidarity, aimed at making non-persons full human beings and then new men and women, according to the design of the new Adam, Jesus Christ. So now, let's go and enjoy this lovely day that God has given us. Let's uh, go and change some lives. Amen.
when our songs of joyful celebration are drowned out by the groans of those in need, echo in creation that's waiting like a prisoner to be free. Father, we cry out, how long until the pain and suffering cease? We pray that your kingdom we fill this world with justice, love, and peace. Have mercy, Lord, on the earth you created.
Let's pray. We pray for the coming of God's kingdom. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. You sent your son to bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, freedom to captives, and salvation to your people. Anoint us with your spirit, rouse us to work in his name. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to bring help to the poor and freedom to the oppressed. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to tell the world the good news of your healing love. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to those who mourn to bring joy and gladness instead of grief. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to proclaim that the time is here for you to save your people. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. God of mercy, you know us and love us and hear our prayer. Keep us in the eternal fellowship of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. So joining all our prayers together, let us say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So let us sing our final song.
So as we end our service this morning, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. So let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.